Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Captain's Quarters. After today, we sadly have just three shows remaining before returning to the studio, and yet so many plot lines we haven't gotten to. For example, there's that B plot with the giant ghost lobster we promised you. My agent told me this would be a multi episode arc. We were going to have an intervention for Steve, the fish who probably has a drug problem. My only problem is I like to party. And Ira, the prospect park duck, requested we do a full closer look about waterfowl education. Well, because we have nine ducklings and we need to know what the deal is with school in the fall, you know? Like, is it remote? Is it a combo? Hey, Seth, do you know what ducks use instead of iPads? What's that, Ira? Lily pads. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, okay. So Ira can't make jokes. Good to know. Very helpful. Also, our beloved sea captain is celebrating the results of last week's poll where we asked, do you enjoy the sea captain during this difficult time? And yes, he's a nice addition. Beat no, I hate fun in a landslide. Now, this time there was not a third option called other, but a lot of you have asked what would have happened if there had been and if in that scenario other had won. Well, in that case, we would have introduced a new character, the sexy mermaid with the unsexy voice. Well, hello there. Very pleased to meet you. Hi, hot stuff. Any of you fellas want to take a dip? Uh, oh, thank um, you. I'm, I'm okay. Don't love the water. And speaking of bummers? Lazy segue. President Trump and the Republican Party are in lockstep behind a plan to dismantle the post office that is both an assault on democracy and the culmination of a decades-long movement to privatize one of the country's most cherished public institutions. For more on this, it's time for a closer look. House Democrats announced yesterday that they'll be returning from recess early to address the crisis at the post office after it was reported that mail sorting machines across the country were being removed and the Postal Service had warned 46 states that voters could be disenfranchised due to the changes. And if you're wondering if it's just coincidental that the post office is being dismantled as the country nears an election that will depend in large part on mail-in voting, one, congrats on waking up from your coma, and two, here's Trump admitting it last week. They want $25 billion, billion, for the post office. Now they need that money in order to have the post office work so it can take all of these millions and millions of ballots. But if they don't get those two items, that means you can't have universal mail-in voting. Once again, he just confesses, just like he did with Russian hacking and the Ukraine quid pro quo. He confesses like he has James Bond strapped to a table. You're probably wondering how I'm going to steal the election. Well, I'll tell you every detail, Mr. Bond, and then I'll turn the laser on and leave the room. The entire Trump presidency has been like an episode of Law & Order where the killer confesses in the first five minutes and then they turn it over to a cable news panel to discuss. I mean, sure, he said he killed him and where he buried the body and when they dug up the body, it did have traces of his DNA. But can we really, can we really take him at his word? Or are we maybe overreacting? Are we maybe overreacting? Now, as we and many others have stated millions of times, there is zero evidence of widespread fraud in mail-in voting. Even Trump's own Voting Integrity Commission couldn't find any evidence of voter fraud. In fact, if anything, mail-in voting is especially secure because you have the physical evidence. If you suspect fraud, you just look at the name and signature on the ballot and make sure it's a legal vote. And yet on Sunday, Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, kept repeating the lie that mail-in voting could somehow lead to fraud. But, but you don't call up and say, hey, no by the way, I'm There's no evidence of widespread voter fraud, though. Uh, that's, but there's no that's not, evidence that, of widespread there's voter no, there's fraud. No, there's, no, there's no evidence that there's not either. That's not how evidence works. You can't arrest someone for possession of cocaine because they can't prove they don't have any cocaine. <laughs> but do you have any? I can get some if you join me for a dip. Ugh, uh, no thanks. I'm going to get clean. That was the intervention. I just had that same Meadows argument with my four-year-old son. There's not a monster in your closet. There's no evidence there isn't either. Damn it, you got me. Where did you learn the Meadows maneuver, boy? You have CNN on all day. I learned it from you, Dad. Now, even before Donald Trump's rise to power, there was a decades-long effort by right-wing billionaires and dead-eyed corporate husks to privatize the post office, which is, according to many polls, the single most popular public institution in America. And if you don't believe me, just watch this ad from Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey featuring some of the most likable Boston postal workers you will ever see. The Postal Service handles in one day 
more business than FedEx and UPS do in a year. It's an integral part of the economy of this country and the security of this country. And right now, it, it's an important part of democracy. We're in every town, we deliver to every house every day. The infrastructures, it can't be matched. If they privatized this institution, we'd be at the mercy of corporations. And we all know they have no mercy. It's so great that masks can keep out coronavirus, but are completely impervious to a Boston accent. No one was watching that thinking, where are those gentlemen from? Hey, we're shooting a commercial here. Can somebody quiet the seagulls down? How can you not love those guys? It's like if the post office was directed by Ben Affleck. We service more homes in a day than FedEx, UPS, and we are sorry to say, even your mother. The post office has been woven into the fabric of America since before the founding. It's as old as the Republic itself. It's literally in the Constitution. The US Postal Service has been delivering mail since before the Declaration of Independence was even signed. President George Washington signed the Postal Service Act, which authorized Congress to create the US Postal Service. This established routes and made it illegal to open anyone's mail. That's right, George Washington made it illegal to open anyone else's mail. Of course, Washington couldn't have envisioned living in a New York City apartment and getting mail for the previous five tenants every day. By the way, if you're watching Melvin Schwartz, Rebecca had the baby, and yet, despite its storied place in our history, there's long been an effort by Republicans and billionaires like Charles Koch to privatize it. As far back as 1988, Ronald Reagan's budget director, James Miller, said, there's no good reason why the Postal Service should remain part of the U.S. government and no good reason why it should enjoy a monopoly over the delivery of letter mail. Yeah, why would you want to stick a 55 cent stamp on your letter when you can walk to the FedEx store and wait in line to pay $12 for the same service? While we're at it, why should the Interior Department have a monopoly on the parks? Let's sell the naming rights to some private companies and turn it into Yellow Cold Stone Creamery National Park or Mountain Dew Code Redwood National Park. We can replace Smokey Bear with a corporate mascot like Chester Cheetah or the Taco Bell Chihuahua. Yokiro Forest Fires. Incidentally, that Reagan official Miller later went on to serve on the Postal Service Board of Governors until his nomination was thankfully blocked by Senator Bernie Sanders at the behest of the postal unions. And you know Bernie loves mail. He's like one of those guys who waits for the mail carrier on the stoop every morning and knows more about their route than they do. Morning, Shirley. Got those CB2 catalogs today, right? And be careful on 4th Avenue. There's a new puddle. And on Sunday, Bernie was one of the most vocal Democrats calling for an immediate investigation of the changes at the USPS. Do you think Speaker Pelosi uh, should call the House of Representatives back uh, to get a freestanding bill uh, to fund the post office uh, uh, in, 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 to the Senate and then to, to the president? Uh, and do you think that the House of Representatives should be using their oversight role and investigating what exactly is going on in terms of the changes that the Postmaster General is making? The answer to both questions uh, is yes. Over three months ago, three months ago, Democrats in the House passed the HEROES Bill. And among many other things, it provided $25 billion for the Postal Service. Bernie's so committed to protecting the Postal Service, he called in on a Sunday from his weekend home inside an Avatar movie? Seriously, Bernie, what? In the world is this Zoom background? That looks like the default screensaver on Windows 95. Surprised he's not surrounded by flying toasters. This is why you gotta love Bernie. The president is a cheesy crook doing press conferences at his ritzy golf club for his millionaire buddies, and Bernie looks like he's on the cover of a Sleep Sounds album from 1985. Listen to the sounds of the forest, the birds chirping, the creeks running. Well, go to sleep already, come on, I got things to do. So in many ways, what we're seeing is not new. It's been a goal of the conservative movement for years. They want to turn one of America's most cherished public institutions into a chain restaurant where you can buy a pack of stamps and unlimited breadsticks. Privatizing the post office is like turning your local fire station into the cable company. My house is on fire. Uh, we'll be there between nine and one. Make sure someone is home. And yet, as an election approaches in which the incumbent president just happens to be trailing badly in the polls, conservatives are suddenly concerned that the post office loses money. Former Fox business host Trish Reagan captured this sentiment yesterday when she tweeted, here's the deal on the United States Postal Service. It's just a bad business. Poorly run, loses billions. If it were any other business, it would have gone under by now. We need to make it more accountable, not keep throwing money at it. Yeah, but it's not a business. 
So telling that you ghouls never say stuff like this about ICE or the police. The Pentagon's had more flops than Johnny Depp, but you guys still love to throw money at it. Also, as we explained last week, the post office was actually profitable until Republicans passed a law in 2006 requiring it to pre-fund 75 years of retiree health benefits in 10 years. And without that law, the post office would have remained profitable. It operated at a loss in the first couple of years of the 21st century, but by 2003, it was back to operating at a profit. In fact, from 2003 through 2006, USPS recorded a total $9.3 billion profit. If not for the 75-year pension and healthcare obligation, the USPS would have reported operating profits for the last six years. The post office turned a profit. Even Uber isn't profitable. In fact, if anything, Uber should be taking cues from the Postal Service. Instead of a Chevy Suburban, they should be riding around picking people up in a mail truck. Hang tight, I gotta pick up three more people. So the same Republicans who are now complaining that the post office loses money are the ones responsible for the post office losing money. It's like if your boss at Krispy Kreme said, why is no one coming to the store? And you said, you made us put up that sign that said we stick our in all the crawlers. Also, side note, is there anything George W. Bush didn't make worse? The guy wrecked everything from the Middle East to the mail to a bunch of perfectly good canvases. I know some people have a tendency to gloss over his eight years as president, but next time you get a wedding invitation in the mail six months after the wedding, just remember, mission accomplished. And now the privatizers have joined forces with a president who's desperate to subvert an election he knows he can't win fairly, which is why he's installed a postmaster general, Louis DeJoy, with tens of millions of dollars worth of conflicts, who donated $360,000 to Trump and the RNC, which is unprecedented. The post office is supposed to be nonpartisan. Putting this guy in charge of the post office is like putting Tom Selleck in charge of HUD. Don't worry, I won't take your house. Would Mr. Baseball lie to you? DeJoy has been gutting the post office just as states prepare for a surge in mail-in ballots thanks to the deadly plague Trump failed to stop. He slowed mail delivery, slashed hours at post offices, removed mail sorting machines across the country, and told 46 states their voters could be disenfranchised by delayed mail-in ballots. And by the way, it's not a matter of whether the Postal Service can handle the volume. Even if every single one of the 150 million registered voters mailed in a ballot, that would be nothing compared to the post office's usual load. The Postal Service processes nearly 500 million pieces of mail every day, and it annually handles more than 3 billion pieces in the week before Christmas alone. Yeah, and just think of how crucial that week before Christmas is. We've all had that moment of terror where we realize we forgot to get a gift for a loved one, panic bought something at the last minute, chose overnight shipping, and then wrapped it in an old newspaper. Here you go, honey. Remember when you said we needed a new toilet brush? Well, I remembered. What we're witnessing right now is a marriage of postal service privatizers and an anti-majoritarian political movement intent on undermining democracy in order to impose its will on everyone else. They know they can't win fairly, so they'll do anything to cheat, including dismantling one of our most cherished public institutions because they have no mercy. This has been A Closer Look. We've been talking about City Harvest since COVID began, and now more than ever, they need your help feeding New York families. If you're watching this online, you can hit the donate button. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask. We love you.